Mount Zion Church, so glad that you have joined us. We're going to study the Word of God here. We are studying the book of Micah, verse by verse, asking God to speak to our hearts. All of our Bible studies are on our website, mzpraise.org. You can go there, click Bible study, you'll find all of them. Uh, we're asking God to, to give us strength, to give us wisdom. This book of Micah is an amazing word uh, from God to us all. So we're going to pray and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a living and active word, as you say. Lord, that you speak to our hearts, Lord. And so we ask that you would give us the ears to hear, uh, Lord, to receive what it is that you would speak to us as we go to your word now. Uh, we love you, Father. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, you notice we're not in the tent as we are recording this Bible study today. Uh, there's work being done down in the tent. So we are up here in the church office and I'm so glad that you have joined us. We are reading this book of Micah. Micah was a prophet living hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. A prophet, someone that God was using to speak his word to uh, his people Israel. Uh, we've seen thus far, we're up to chapter four at verse one here. We've seen thus far that Micah was speaking a word of warning. He was speaking particularly a word of warning to those who were powerful and wealthy in the land of Israel as they were taking advantage of the poor, turning their backs on uh, the word of God more and more and more. And they were bringing the chastening, disciplining hand of God upon them all. And Micah is speaking this word of warning to them. And uh, we've seen, as we've read so far, uh, that things outwardly were going great for the people of Israel at the time, especially for the powerful, for the wealthy. They're listening to Micah speak all these words of God's chastening, disciplining hand coming upon them. And they're like, yeah, well, we don't see it. But God was speaking through Micah and they weren't listening. Just like God warns us and warns us when we're on a road that's heading to destruction. He warns us. We go to his word. Uh, we're in worship. We hear a preacher preach, right? Uh, we're just living our life and we hear this warning inside our hearts. Here's God saying, I love you. I don't want you to go down a road of destruction. Uh, if you won't turn, I will put my hand on you. I will press you down to stop you from heading to destruction. And even then, as we've seen, we always have that choice. We can heed the warnings of God uh, or we can just keep on going. Uh, you know, if you're driving down a road and the, there's a sign that says the bridge is out, but you keep flying down a road 70 miles an hour, you're gonna go into the river, right? And if you don't heed the warning. So it's the same with God. Here he warns and warns his people. My chastening hand is coming upon you. Now, the thing that we've been saying all along here in this book of Micah is that God chastens those whom he loves. He disciplines us. He, he, he presses us down because he loves us. Just as a loving parent uh, will discipline his or her children to, to get our children's attention, uh, to instruct them, look, you go this way, there's consequences. And so God chastens those whom he loves. Sometimes when life is hard, when uh, the circumstances of our life are the result of our own foolishness, our own stubbornness, our own pridefulness, uh, and then life gets very hard and difficult, uh, we sometimes feel as if, well, God's given up on me. He's turned his back on me. He wants nothing to do with me anymore. Look at my life. He's obviously not blessing me anymore. And here's God saying again and again, no, I chasten you because I love you. So we're going to pick up here in chapter four at verse one. Uh, since we're not filming down in the tent, we don't have all our uh, technology that we have down there. So we won't have the verses on the screen. So you might want to uh, have uh, your Bible open in front of you. Uh, turn to Micah chapter four at verse one. And that's where we're going to start right now. So let's look at that verse one. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. 
Now suddenly, with all of these warnings, with all of the, the, the words of Micah just, you know, announcing there's danger ahead, stop, turn back to the Lord, stop rebelling against him, humble yourself before him. Suddenly, Micah gives us now just, he turns the direction. But what he's talking about now is that, yes, he chastens those whom he loves, but Micah does it in a way that's, that's pretty amazing. So when he says, it shall come to pass in the latter days, he suddenly takes the vision of those who were first hearing him and our vision now, and he directs it far beyond the present circumstance, far beyond whatever maybe challenging time you're walking through in life right now. He says, in the latter days, it shall come to pass, What's going to happen, he's saying, in the latter days. And what does he mean, latter days? Here's what he means. He means that all of history is in God's hands. He means that time itself is in God's hands. So, you know, maybe you were taught in school that, you know, just you were taught maybe that the universe is infinite, that time is infinite. The universe just goes on and on. It all, you know, and time always was and always will be. That's not what this Bible says. And by the way, that's not what the greatest scientist in the history of the world said. Albert Einstein proved conclusively the universe is not infinite. It's impossible. Time is not infinite. That's impossible. So time had a beginning and it will have an end, right? The time that God has created for this world had a beginning and it will have an end. And so here, suddenly, Micah takes our vision beyond even the end of time as we know it here on this earth. You know, when you're walking through some hard time, whether it's the Lord chastening you or it's just the hard circumstances of life, right, to have that vision of beyond, beyond all the struggles of the time of this world, beyond the struggles that we uh, deal with, you know, just day by day in this world, to get that vision beyond brings a tremendous strength, a tremendous courage to our lives. You've heard maybe that old saying, oh, he's so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. Yeah, well, that's a huge lie. It's people who are the most heavenly minded. In other words, people who have their eyes on beyond the end of this world, the time of this world right now, beyond the end of this world, beyond the end of my life on this world. It's people who have their eyes on, on beyond, right? Who have the most courage, who have the most strength, who are filled with the most compassion and the most love. Why? If I know that beyond all the difficulties and challenges of life in this world, that God's gonna wipe away all my tears, that sorrow and sighing are going to flee away, that everlasting joy is going to come. If I know that, if I have my eyes on that day, then whatever I need to do, right, to bring his love to this world around me, whatever I need to do to keep going, you know, traveling the road that God would have me to travel, I can do it. I can get the strength and I can get the determination right, to keep on going, to keep loving people, to keep blessing those who are struggling. I can get the determination not to give up, right? Not to say, ah, there's no point in all this. The world's just a disaster and always will be. No, if I know the disasters of this world have an end, right? That disasters of this world have an end. But God, you know, you know the way I, I say, it. Pastor Greg says this, right? Our life in this world is just chapter one. But if I know that beyond chapter one, beyond even the history of this world, right, then uh, the chapters two and three and four and all the rest, if I know that, right, and I know what God says about chapters two, three, and four, then I get the strength to do chapter one well. And so that's what Mike is getting at here. So he says, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. What does, it, what does that mean? So it means that the city of Jerusalem was built on, they would call it a mountain. We'd probably call it a big hill. Mountain, big hill, whatever it was. 
uh, well, in fact, the next phrase there in that verse one, it shall be lifted up above the hills, right? That the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, the temple that God had instructed the people to build there in Jerusalem to his glory, right? So shall be established as the highest of the mountains. So in ancient times and in places today in this world, uh, people believed that, that the mountaintops were where the gods dwelt. And if you looked at the mountains of some of the nations that surrounded the nation of Israel, uh, their mountains were much more grand, they much loftier, much bigger mountains than, than the mountains of, of Israel, of Jerusalem here. And the, the hill or the mountain uh, that, mount, that the temple was built on was not really a very big mountain at all. Uh, so uh, what was the name of that hill, by the way? Mount Zion. It's where this church, Mount Zion Church, gets its name. God instructed his people to build that temple, to build the city of Jerusalem on this Mount Zion. So he says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. In other words, all the, the gods of this world, whether it's gods the way people have thought about gods, whether it's the uh, whatever the peoples of this world pride themselves in, their wealth, their power, their strength. He says, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be the highest of the mountains, that the Lord will triumph over all. Uh, sometimes it seems, right, that, that the greed of this world, the wickedness of this world, the, the, the violence of this world, all the junk of this world, seems so much more powerful than the goodness of God, right? That's what it feels like, right? That the goodness of God is nothing compared to all the, the junk of the world. And here's Micah saying, nope, in fact, it's God who rules over all. It's God who will be seen by all as the ruler of all, not only this world, but of all creation. You know, when you know that, as a follower of Jesus, when I know that he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, then I have a determination in my heart to keep doing what he did when he was here on this earth, to keep blessing those who were judged and ignored and forgotten and condemned, to keep bringing this, this amazing love of Jesus to a, a broken, lost, hurting world, when I know that he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, that his goodness will triumph over all. If I look at this world and I just conclude, well, goodness will never triumph in this wicked world, then it's like, what's the point of anything? But if I know, no, his goodness will triumph, then I will keep following after him, doing what he did as he was here on this earth. So he says, it shall be lifted up above the hills and peoples shall flow to it. People will come to the Lord. Now, we're going to see as, as we read on here, Micah's talking about the day even beyond our day. Here he was, you know, 600 years before the time of Jesus, and he was pointing, even as he's speaking this, to a day beyond our day. He's pointing even beyond the end of the history of this world. He's pointing beyond the day when, as in the book of Revelation, it tells us that last trumpet will sound. And the Lord will come and gather all of his people and, and, and the Lord will then renew the face of the whole earth, right? He's pointing beyond that. He's pointing beyond the day when, as at the very end of the book of Revelation, it says the new Jerusalem shall come down out of heaven from God, the people of God after that day of judgment, right? Those who are prideful and arrogant and will never humble themselves before the Lord, and therefore will always bring their wickedness to, to uh, everyone all around them. God will say to them on that day of judgment, depart from me. But those who humble themselves before the Lord and say, yes, I need you to be the King, the Lord, the Savior, the God of my life. Those, what does he do? He brings them back to this world, this world renewed. This world no longer with the, the wickedness and the tragedy and the sorrow that we've seen. And so here, Micah's pointing to that day. Why is he pointing to that day even, what, 2,600 years ago? 
Because when we know that day's coming is when we have the determination, I will humble myself before the Lord. I will do what he sent me here on this earth to do. I will bring his goodness to this world all around me because I know, right, that he is the king of all kings. I know that his goodness will triumph. So he says, people shall flow to it. Uh, we will all look to him. We will look to the Lord. Now, as I say, this is beyond our time even today. This is beyond even that last sounding of that last trumpet, right? The end of history as we know it. But yet we see now here Israel was, right? The only people that God was relating to on, on, in all the earth. And it would be that way until the father sent his son, sent Jesus, and then said, now you, he uh, says to his, the followers of Jesus, right? You go and, and tell all the world. And what's happened since that day, right? Then what? In an amazing way, there were 120 followers of Jesus. That's it. Read in the, the second chapter of the book of Acts. After Jesus died on the cross and the father raised him up, how many followers did he have? 120. That's it. And yet they went and they went and they went and they went and they went, right? And, and so all of us who know the true and living God today in Jesus is because starting with that 120 people, they went and they went and they went. And what I'm getting to here is, look, that today, whereas then in Micah's day, Israel was some just tiny little group of people with this temple to their God, right? There were much bigger, more powerful nations everywhere, right? This is a tiny little group of people, small number of people who knew the true and living God. Now, in every nation, every tribe, every tongue, right? People have come to know the true and living God. People shall flow to it. People are looking. Israel could have never imagined, the people of Israel in Micah's day could have never imagined that from all nations, from all tribes, from people of all tongues, all languages, would be looking to the true and living God. So at verse two, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So, yes, beyond the history of this world, uh, all the citizens of this world will look to him. All the peoples. If you ever, you know, Maybe you were a kid in Sunday school and you would see uh, pictures, little pictures in your Sunday school class about heaven, right? And you'd see uh, everybody kind of floating on clouds. I know I would, I would see those pictures when I was a little kid and I think, okay, when I die, I'm going to float in cl on clouds forever. Like that didn't sound very good to me, right? What does the Bible say? It only says we meet the Lord in the air. But then beyond, right? Beyond then. Uh, the, the meeting the Lord in the air beyond that day of judgment, the people of God coming back to this earth. There's chapters two, three, four, and all the rest. So that's what's being described here. You know, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, right? That's what's being described here. People, all people will look to the Lord. But as we, as we just said also, however, even now, even with then just uh, the followers of Jesus lifting up Jesus, lifting up Jesus, and just nation after nation, person, heart after heart, people group after people group coming to know the Lord, Israel could have never imagined that, never imagined it. But yes, that he may teach us his ways from every nation, tribe, and tongue. The history of how Jesus has been lifted up from this nation to this nation to this nation, from this people group to this people group, from this tribe to this tribe is astounding. I want to tell you a story. Uh, our church operates an orphanage, uh, orphan care ministry uh, in the nation of Namibia in southern Africa. And I met two young men when I was there uh, we are uh, right uh, at the river. Uh, um, across the river is uh, the nation of Zambia. And 
I met two young men who told me they were from Namibia and they were telling me about a three month mission tour that they did walking, they, they went across the river, walking from village to village to village to village to village in very remote areas, right? Uh, lifting up the name of Jesus. Now, these two young men, young men, like everyone else in the region right there, they had nothing. They had no cash in their pockets, like nothing. They just were determined to go to all these remote villages where there was hardly any knowledge of the Lord at all. And they just walked from village to village, depending on the people of the villages they went to to give them some food to eat. And they shared Jesus for three months, just going and going and going and going. And that's, that's exactly what Mike is getting at here, right? In the ongoing history from the day that Jesus, you know, went to that cross and was raised up from death and, and told his followers, now you go and tell all nations. That's what's happened. That's what happened from that day to this day. And, and then beyond this world, all the more, all the peoples of the nation of the world will look to him. So he says that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. You know, we, we can read these scriptures in, in so many different ways, right? Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. So I love the name of this church, Mount Zion, right? Let's go to Mount Zion, that he, that the Lord may teach us his ways. That's why we gather together in worship. Right? That's why we gather together in Bible studies. That's why we gather together to encourage one another. That the Lord, not, not some preacher, not, not some whatever, right? But that the Lord would teach us his ways. That he would speak to our hearts. That we, why? That we may walk in his paths. We gather together week by week in worship. We gather together week by week in small groups, in, in Bible studies, that the Lord would teach us his ways so that we would live. When he says walk in his paths, that means that live our lives step by step, day by day, according to how it is that he has commanded us, instructed us to live. Uh, and so uh, we, we have this incredible privilege of not just having the word here in black and white, but we have this privilege of the Lord himself saying, I will teach you my word. You know, when you put your faith in Jesus, you ask the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God to dwell in your heart. And what, he, what did Jesus say? He, the Spirit of God, will teach you all things. He will remind you the words that Jesus spoke and teach you the truth of his word. He says, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He speaks the word of the Lord. The Lord speaks to our hearts. I know I've been in worship so many times. Now I'm a preacher, right? But I know as I have been preaching, I'm hearing so often the Lord speaking directly. It's not, I'm not just hearing my own words come out of my mouth. I'm hearing the Lord speak directly to my heart. Let's look at verse 3. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now here we have, right, a clear word that the Lord... That the Lord, speaking through Micah, is pointing us beyond the history of this world as we know it now. He's pointing us beyond uh, that day when that last trumpet of history sounds, right? He's pointing us beyond uh, the day when the people of God will come back to this earth, uh, saying, he shall judge between many peoples, shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. He will rule over this earth. There will be no more earthly governments, right? He will rule over this earth. Judge between many peoples, decide disputes for strong nations far away. He will rule over all the earth. Does this just sound like, what, what do they used to say? Pie in the sky, by and by, right? You just sound like, oh, that's just a fairy tale and everything will be perfect and wonderful. 
Here's our God saying, no, this day is coming. This day is coming. What? I mean, if God created us and he created this world and this is just the way it's going to be, the way it is right now, with all this wickedness, all this selfishness, all this tragedy, then that's, that's pathetic, right? That's horrendous. When you start, I mean, I know as a pastor, people come to me uh, sitting right here in this room right, and just pour out their hearts to me, right? And I hear these horrendous stories of, of huge pain, of huge wickedness that came against what children and just, just persons, right? If that's all this world is ever going to be, that's awful. It's just, just pretend that there's no hope, there's no real reason to, to do much good of any guy, if that's just what it's going to be. Here's God saying, no, the day is coming when my goodness will triumph over all creation. And so then he's talking about the nations. He says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, right? Instead of fighting one another, uh, their swords they'll use as, as plows, right? Uh, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. There will be peace. There will be war no more. No more war, right? If the history of the world forever is, was going to be war, hatred, violence, I mean, I know it breaks your heart to see, right, the war, or we've been watching this war in Ukraine, now this horrendous war breaking out in Sudan. It's just, right, horrendous. Is this what going to be forever? Here's God saying, no, no. Right? Neither says they shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So here's God saying, you be my peacemakers now. That's what Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. You be those who bring love, not hatred, to this world. You uh, be those who bring kindness and mercy, not anger to this world. You live as I've told you to live in this world because what I have told you is what will triumph, what will be uh, you know, established over all the earth. You live humbly before me now. So at verse four, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. You know, if we uh, went back just to chapter three here in this Micah, and Micah, right, God, God through Micah was just blasting the powerful and the wealthy who were just taking advantage of the poor, right? Stealing their homes, their lands, stealing everything they had. Uh, here's now Micah giving a vision of that day when there will be no wickedness, there will be no, uh, you know, corruption of, of the poor just being taken advantage of again and again and again, beaten up again and again in this world. Everyone uh, will, uh, what, sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. No one shall make them afraid. This is why as followers of Jesus, right, we speak up now. We speak up now against the corruption of this world, against the poor, uh, you know, just being taken advantage of by the powerful over and over again. You know, right here in the history of America, who was it who brought about finally child labor laws, right? In other words, instead of children working 14 hours a day in factories and coal mines for pennies, who was it who led the fight to establish child labor laws. It was followers of Jesus. It was church folk here in America that led that fight. And it was no simple little effort of writing a few letters to Congress, right? I mean, read the story of how child labor laws finally got established here in America. Man, it was, it was just horrendous violence and hatred came against, right? By the powerful, right? Came against the followers of Jesus who said, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. Where do we get the strength? Where did they get the strength to fight that fight, right? They got that strength right here, right? No one shall make them afraid, right? That day is coming when the powerful shall not take advantage of the weak and the poor, right? So we fight this good fight, right? We live our lives well now, knowing 
these, this day is coming. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. God says, this is what will be. You work for it now. You work to bring heart after heart after heart to me. You work now to protect those. What does tell us in the, the book of Proverbs? You know, uh, those who are stumbling to the slaughter, uh, rescue them, hold them back from the slaughter that's coming against, right? Those who are heading to, to destruction at the hands, you know, either their own prideful foolishness or at the hands of others. Why do we do all that? Because we know the day is coming when the goodness of God will triumph. So at verse five, for all the peoples walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Here he's saying everyone, you know, has their own God, whether it's a God the way we think of gods, right? The statues, the idols of various gods, or if it's the God of wealth, the God of power, the God of whatever, everyone has their own God. But Micah says, we will walk. In other words, we will live moment by moment, day by day, step by step in the name of the Lord, our God, forever and ever. He will triumph over all the, the, the power, the wealth, the wickedness of this world. What an amazing promise. He uh, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The the wickedness, the darkness of the world that seems so powerful will not triumph over our true and living, the one true and living God. His will will be established in your life, in my life. We keep our eyes on these promises. By the way, this uh, passage we've just read here, verses one to five, uh, you'll find almost the exact same words in Isaiah chapter two, verses one to five. It's pretty Pretty fascinating, right? Now, let's look at uh, verse six. Uh, uh, Micah goes on. He says, in that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. He says, in that day, beyond, right? Beyond this world, beyond the history of this world, he says, I will assemble the lame those who have been forgotten by the world, the, the lame, the, 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 the poor, blind beggar sitting by the road, the paralyzed beggar lying on a mat every day. Uh, if you think those visions, you know, the blind beggar by the side of the road, the, 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 the paralyzed beggar laying on a mat, if you think that was just in ancient times, go to the poor places of this world today. I went to our orphanage uh, some years ago, and I think it was three years later, I uh, went back to our orphanage and I had gone into town the first time. I went in the town the, the second time I was there, three years later, I saw the same man sitting at the same place on the same curb alongside the street that I had seen three years before. Wow. Wow. But here's this promise that beyond this world, the Lord says, I will assemble the lame, gather those who have been driven away. In other words, the Lord does not forget the least, right? Those who have nothing in this world. He says, I will gather them. I will gather them. What does the Bible say? Has not God chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith? That's what I've learned so powerfully over these last years uh, of, of my career here as a, as a pastor, right? As I've realized those who are the most beaten down, those who have walked through the hardest struggles, I've realized, I've learned just as God said, they have the strongest faith, right? And so here is the Lord saying, you know what? I do not forget those that the world forgets. And then he says, he says, I gather those who have been driven away the world, those who the world just pushes aside, pushes away. I will gather them. And then he says, and those whom I have afflicted. He says, I chasten those whom I love. I chasten those whom I love. It, it, he says, I love even those who I've chastened. He says, when I've chastened you, it's not because I now hate you. 
I love you. I will gather my people. Uh, and so he goes on at, at verse seven, and the lame I will make the remnant and those who were cast off a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. So the vision is starting to change here from beyond history now back to the moment that Micah was living in. So we saw in chapter three that, that Micah was specifically speaking hard words to those in power, right? They had political power or just the power of great wealth. And he said, you are bringing the chastening, judge, you know, disciplining hand of God upon yourself. But in turn, that will, of course, come upon all the people of this nation. You know, and they were all just laughing and scoffing at Micah's words, right? Because they didn't see any hard times coming. Sure enough, the Assyrians came, this huge empire to the north, came down uh, to, to the west of Jerusalem, but then came up that, that desert road to Jerusalem and brought right? Just destruction. So uh, here's, here's the Lord saying, you know what? Though you, you who, who pridefully, arrogantly have just not heeded the warnings that I've, I've given you, you've, you've ignored everything I've said to you. He said, I will gather. And, and by doing that, you've brought pain to everyone else. He said, the lame, those the poor beggar by the side of the road, who now also is, is, you know, the beggar by the side of the road when the Assyrian army comes wreaking destruction on, on Jerusalem. The beggar by the side of the road, he said, I will make the remnant. These will remain my people. I will be with them even when the, the, the chastening comes to this nation. You know, it's, it's words like this right here, why I don't get all bent out of shape and filled with fear when I look at, you know, what's going on in our own nation here right now in these United States of America, when I look at what's going on in the world, right? I don't, I don't get like filled with anger, filled with terror or whatever. Like I see so many people are so afraid what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. Here's God saying, look, you keep your heart humble before me. You keep your heart humble before me. You are my remnant. You, you will remain my child. Whatever chaos is going on, I will remain your father, your heavenly father, your God, your Lord, your, your protector, your shield, your defense. He says, I, the lame I will make the remnant, those who were cast off a strong nation. I, the, you, the, those who are the weakest in this world, what did the Apostle Paul learn? When I am weak, then I'm strong. Remember the Apostle Paul, one of those first followers of Jesus, right? He had this, what appears to be a horrendous eye disease, right? And he, he was asking and asking the Lord to heal him. And the Lord taught him, you know, Paul, when you're weak, then you're strong. In your weakness, I will be your strength. You, you rely upon me and you will be strong. And so here, those who were cast off, those who were ignored the least, will be a strong nation. The Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. He's kind of like speaking both at the, you know, in his own immediate circumstance there in ancient Israel and now beyond, beyond. You know, we have this beautiful special needs ministry here at Mount Zion. And uh, Brian, who leads our, our, uh, our special needs ministry, uh, sometimes uh, students from some of the high schools in the area here come and volunteer uh, at our meetings. And Brian does a little orientation with them. And one of the things he says to them, he says, look, when we're in heaven, he says, you better be nice to, to these folks right here right now, because when we're in heaven, they're going to be in charge, <laughs> right? What, what did Jesus say? The last will be first, right? The first will be last. So that's what he's saying here, that the lame I will make the remnant, those who were cast off a strong nation, right? Uh, that uh, the, the least of this world, the least of this world uh, will be a strong nation, as he says. Uh, so uh, from this time forth and forevermore. So he's kind of talking about ancient Israel, but beyond all of time. So look at verse eight. 
And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. So what's he talking about here? Well, he says, and you, O tower of the flock. So we have the image of now a, a flock of sheep, right? O tower of the flock, tower represented strength. Uh, we see so many towers in our modern world. We go to our big cities and there's just, you know, huge buildings everywhere. They didn't have many towers in the ancient world. When you saw a tower, you were in awe of, of this, this building. You're a farmer living out in the middle of nowhere. You go into the big city and here's some tower in that big city and you're amazed by it. So it represented great strength. So he says, and you, O tower of the flock, He's talking about the shepherd, shepherd of the flock. But then he says, hill of the daughter of Zion. So he says, um, the hill, Mount Zion, of the daughter of Zion, meaning the people of God. You, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. Okay, what's he getting at here? The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. He's saying, I will be your shepherd. I will raise up shepherds for you now. Think of a king, the ruler of the people. They were pathetic shepherds, right? That's what Micah kept telling them. You're not shepherding the people. You're not caring for the flock. He's saying, I will raise up for you shepherds who will care for you, who will do fulfill their responsibilities as persons who have authority. But he's saying beyond that, I will be your shepherd. I will be your shepherd. To you shall it come, the former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. You will have a king. Jesus will be your king. He will be your shepherd. He will watch over you. Uh, it's it's kind of hidden in those words there, but it's an incredible promise that uh, here's our God saying, I will be your shepherd. So at verse nine, then he says, now, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? The, that pain, has your counselor perished? That pain seized you like a woman in labor? He's, he's speaking, uh, he's, he's going right back to their, their present situation. He's saying, is there no king in you? You don't have a king that is worthy of being a king. You have no leader that's, that's leading you well. He says, has your counselor perished? There's no one giving you wisdom. Uh, he says, uh, that pain seized you like a woman in labor. You you've, you just have this, you've got no one leading you. You've got no one shepherding you. You've got no one guiding you, giving you any wisdom. Uh, uh, he says, why do you cry aloud? It's kind of like a, what we'd say, a rhetorical question. Yeah, you're, you're looking around, you see you've got nothing. He's speaking to the people of Israel at that time. He's speaking to you and me. Like, do you see in this world, do you see any, any wisdom in this world? Do you see any political leaders that are worthy of being your shepherd? Do you see any wisdom in this world that is worthy of, of guiding and directing your life? He's saying, I will be your shepherd. Here's the father saying, my son Jesus will be your shepherd. So at verse 10, he says, writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. So he says, writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a, a woman in labor. Uh, you know, you can't escape this pain that, that you're in right now. He's, he's speaking to them as the, the chastening hand of God is coming upon them, the Assyrians. And then he jumps here all the way ahead to the Babylonians who came after the Assyrians. He said, they're, they're, they're coming. He says, you shall go out from the city. They're going to take you away as slaves, right? Dwell in the open country. They're just going to scatter you. Right? You shall go to Babylon. You'll be slaves up in Babylon. But look what he says. There you shall be rescued. 
There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. He's saying, you've brought this upon yourself. You wouldn't heed my warnings. You, you wouldn't listen to me. You wouldn't humble yourself before me. You've brought this upon yourself. You, you, you didn't have those in power in your land. They weren't leading you well. Uh, there was no one, those who were supposed to be your counselors, right? Speaking to you the word of God. They weren't doing that. So he says, writhe and groan like a woman in labor. Yep, you're in bad way right now. But even when you are taken away as slaves, there you shall be rescued. There I will redeem you. What does the word redeem mean? So that comes from ancient times. Um, uh, you could redeem a slave, right, by paying a price that that slave be set free. And here's the Lord saying, I will pay a price to set you free. What's he talking about? He's talking about the father saying, I will give my son. My son will go to that cross. He will go to hell on that cross to rescue you, to set you free from the hand of your enemies. You know, we can look at, at our lives and, and see how it was that we ignored the Lord, we turned our back on him, right? And, and we just got farther and farther away from him. And then Jesus comes knocking at the door of our hearts. He comes calling to our hearts. He comes and says, look, look what I did for you. I went to that cross. I took your sin. I took your grief. I took your sorrow upon myself on that cross to pay the price for you to come back, to pay the price of, of what it would take to reconcile your heart, to turn your heart back to me, to pay, in other words, the price of your sin right? To, to heal you by taking your sorrow and your grief upon myself and taking it all to hell and leaving it there. And so at verse 11, now many nations are assembled against you saying, let her be defiled and let our eyes gaze upon Zion. Mike is speaking at all different levels here. He's, he's speaking at the level of where he was at, where the people were at in his time. Uh, and people would have been listening to him saying, what are you talking about? Many nations are assembled against you, saying, let her be defiled. Let her eyes gaze upon Zion. They would have said to Micah, what are you talking about? We're fine. Our enemies are far away. Yet they were coming. He's saying the day's coming sooner than you think. The days are coming. Uh, he's also talking, right, about the persecution that would come against God's people all through history followers of Jesus, the first 400 years of the followers of Jesus living in that Roman Empire, horrendous persecution came upon them. And then as they spread from nation to nation all through the world, even today, uh, there was a hearing in the United States Congress, I don't know, not too many years ago, uh, where it was clearly documented that the level of persecution of Christians in this world is at unprecedented high, right? The number of Followers of Jesus being persecuted severely in this world today is huge. Here's God saying, uh, yep, that will happen. At verse 12, but they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. So isn't this, I, this, is this book of Micah, it's, it's not easy, right? It seems like his thoughts are just going all over the place, right? So he's saying, the Lord's going to chasten his people Israel at the hand of the Assyrians, and then he even speaks then of the Babylonians beyond them. But at the same time, he's saying, look, it's not like God chose some people who are better than the Israelites, like, oh, the Assyrians, I'll get them to conquer Israel because they're doing better, or the Babylonians. No. He, he, here's the Assyrians, they were far more wicked than the Israelites. The Babylonians, far more wicked than the Assyrians or the Israelites, right? So... God allowed them, God used them to humble his own people, but he didn't cause them. God is never the author of sin. He didn't cause the Assyrians to come and wreak such havoc. He didn't cause the Babylonians to come and take away people as slaves, right? He didn't cause that. And so here he doesn't cause when persons are bringing just this persecution 
today, right, against followers of Jesus. He doesn't cause anyone to bring great harm and wickedness uh, to others. Uh, says, uh, But it says they, they do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. So the threshing floor. Um, an ancient uh, farmer would gather the, 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 the wheat, right? And the threshing floor would be a place where there were, were rocks and you would, you would beat the wheat. Uh, to, you're trying to separate the kernels that you want from all the rest of the, the shaft, right, the, the plant. And it's, it, instead of trying to pick hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tiny little candles, you, you beat it. Then what they do? They would toss it up in the air. The chaff would blow, blow away and the kernels would fall down. And that's how they, you know, we have machinery that does all that today, right? Well, he, here God's using that image as the judgment of God. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, right, who were God, you know, they came and, yep, God used them. He allowed them to come. He didn't stop them, prevent them from coming upon Israel because Israel needed to be humbled and chastened. But yet they would be responsible, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, responsible for their own wickedness. And a day of judgment is coming that day of judgment. He, we see this a number of places in scripture where that threshing floor is an image, right, of the judgment that the chaff will blow away and the kernel God will gather his people, the kernel that he wants. So at verse 13, arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron and I will make your hoofs bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples and shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole world earth. Wow. Wow. So what's he saying here? Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion. Uh, I will make your horn iron. In other words, it's a symbol of strength. The horn of an ox was a symbol of great strength. He says, look, I understand you're being beaten up. I understand now you're slaves in Babylon, but I'm giving you a strength beyond yourself. I'm giving you, he says, I will make your hooves bronze, uh, the hoof of an ox, right? Uh, strength. Uh, he says, you shall beat in pieces many peoples. What does that mean? It means you are my people. You are my people. And I will give you a strength. I will give you a strength beyond yourself in the midst of a wicked world. A world in which beats us up. Now, he's been speaking about that chastening hand of God. God will chasten us even at the hands of the wickedness of this world. He chastens us. But he says, but you, the you who humble yourselves before me, I will give you a strength uh, so that uh, you will not be defeated. You will not be destroyed by the wickedness of this world, shall devote their gain to their Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. What does that mean? It means that uh, this, what, what appears to be the case now, that the wickedness, the power of this world is so great that it just seems like it will always prevail. And here he's saying, you know, my people, my people who appear to have no power, who appear to have nothing, right? My people will prevail. Our God will rule over all the earth. Well, we're going to stop right there. That chapter four is pretty uh, challenging, especially that second half of that chapter four, pretty challenging. Micah just seems like he's going all over the place. There's one word through all of this. There's one word you've heard me say through all of this. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes over the promises he makes. Keep your eyes on what he has promised. You can have the strength. You, you, he says, I will make your horn iron. You, he gives us the strength. He gives us the strength to endure, to persevere, no matter what comes against us. All right, we're going to stop right there. Uh, I'm so glad that you have joined us. Uh, again, I want to remind you, all our Bible studies are on our website, mzpraise.org. Go there, click Bible study. You'll find them all. Let's, let's join our hearts in prayer right now. Lord God, we thank you for your word. You've given us a, a challenging word here today. 
Lord God, we ask that you would help us, Lord God, as we live our lives in this world. Help us, Lord, to, to hold fast, to hold on to the promises that you've made to us. As we walk through seasons of great challenge, seasons of great difficulty, as we even walk through times where we know we are reaping the consequences of our own actions, Lord, our own foolishness, Lord, give us the, the courage, give us the faith to look to you, to trust in you, to humble ourselves before you, to know that the wickedness of this world will not triumph. Give us the, the courage, the faith, Lord God, to believe the promises that you have made that your goodness will triumph over all the world. And therefore, Lord, keep us at the tasks that you give us to do in this world right now, bringing your goodness to this world, bringing your love to this world. Father, we thank you. We lift our hearts before you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, Mount Zion. Thank you for joining us.